Thank you very much, and thank you, Sarah, for introducing me. I'm actually today here not speaking uh, in my position. I'm speaking in my personal capacity as a peace builder. And I um, share with you three stories that helped me to grow and to learn in this field. Imagine this. We are sitting in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in a small village. It's very hot. The jungle is around us, people are coming and going. And I'm sitting on a white chair, waiting for a meeting that was supposed to start two hours ago. Gradually, the participants of the meeting are coming in. Hi, how are you? How's the family? How's the road? We wait in silence. When the village chief and the woman leader and the youth leader arrive, the meeting starts. There are the traditional introductions, and then everybody starts sharing a story. I get the translation. My translator is whispering, and sometimes he stops, because the horrors of war are not translatable. And also, how can you put this white woman through this? We are in Liberia in 2007, after the civil war that claimed 200,000 lives and displaced over a million people. The meeting lasts until after midnight, and sometimes there are breaks, and the leaders are coming over to me, we just discuss what just happened in the meeting. What can I do? I can just be there, listen, ask questions, give my moral support, being present. And this is maybe one of the lessons learned that I had during this experience in Liberia. I went back, to, maybe first, just to say, I went back to this village over four years. And the meetings, they were around the youth who, ha who was forced during the war to commit crimes against their own community, against their own parents. And it was about reintegrating these youth in the society, in the community. And often the leaders ask me, but how can we reconcile after all of this has happened? And how can we deal with this silence of grief, of pain, of horror? How can we move on? And obviously, we all didn't have the answer. We started a few projects. Some managed to go through, some not because what does a project help for economic reintegration if your mind is not free? But the lesson that I learned there, and I want to come back to this, was that the human connection, the human relationship is transformative. It is transformative because it is opposite to the dehumanization that the people went through and it gives back the dignity that creates a possibility to create perspectives. So I was an outsider there, of course, as a European, but that helped me somehow, because I was very open with them as well about my past. My parents' grandparents, they went through war, but not me. So somehow I was also a living proof that change and transformation is possible, but over generations. It's not a matter of just a day. My peace building career started in 1997 in my hometown in Basel. I was part of the youth parliament there, and the town was preparing for the 100 years jubilee of the first Zionist Congress that took place in Basel 100 years before. I looked at the program, there was no youth, and there was no diversity in participation in this Congress. And I said, okay, let's organize a youth Congress. I went to the city and I said, I want to organize a youth Congress, can we, give, can we have a little bit of money, can we invite people? 
and they said, well, they were a bit hesitant. I think today they were frightened that this gets out of hand. In the end, we insisted and we managed to, do, to get on the official program, but we didn't get the funding from them. We got in-kind funding. When I sent the invitations by fax at the time to the political parties of all spectrum, I thought they would say, yes, well, great, we come. But that was not the answer. First of all, it took a long time to get an answer. And their question was, whom did you invite? Who else will come? What's your plan? Who is behind this? And what's the outcome document? I've never thought about this. The Congress was a success. We had a lot of media there, international media. And the youth, they really got into a connection. They got into a dialogue. We had Israelis and Palestinians, and we really discussed real issues. We had clapping doors. They came back. The real thing, the real dialogue. Um, we didn't come to an outcome document. We didn't get the agreement in the end, but we had a substantive dialogue. And some of these people who participated in Basel in 97, they are still in touch today, despite October 7. This gives me hope. Peace is inevitable. When political will is not there and there is resistance, I also learned from this example, we are doing the right thing. When nobody wants to talk about peace, we have to start doing it. It takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of risk, but it is our task to deal with this resistance. Peace becomes a no word in many areas of this world, unfortunately, but we still have to work on it. We have to work on the messages and we have to place the messages in the right political fora. And that's exactly how I see my role today. I'm trying to place the messages in the right spaces and I'm trying to work a little bit to move these resistances, just a little bit. Small steps. My third example brings me to Mali. In 2015, you all remember there was a peace agreement in in uh, the, the Accord d'Alger, uh, a peace agreement on Mali. And the implementation took some time because there was a lot of questions of how this implementation should go. There were committees and subcommittees, and I was part of a subcommittee to discuss the implementation of this agreement. On behalf of the EU, I was there. And at some point, in one of the first meetings, we were about 50 people around the table. I noted that I was the only woman, and I was taking notes. Now, we all know that women have had a lot of input into that agreement, and they had a lot of input in its implementation. But the fact that they were not sitting at the table, I mean, is that the future of peace? Not really. I think we really need to make an effort to put the issues where the women are negotiating and creating these patches for peace every day on the local ground to take these elements into the high-level peace negotiations. It is absolutely important. And also today we know that the geopolitical tension tear apart the women's organizations, the women's networks, even the peace-building community. We shouldn't let that happen. If we want to create peace, if we want to create a change, we should never let this voice go. Today, we have a, a war in Europe. We should never let this voice go. To conclude, what is my hope? I think humanity has huge challenges in front of us. I think at the summit of the future, they will discuss this. For example, climate change and the environment. We need peace for that. And at some point, in order to overcome these challenges, we really need to come together. And then we shouldn't forget 
that peace is not an event, it is a process. It is about human relationship. It needs to be inclusive and there needs to be a lot of individual and political courage from all of us to get there. I strongly believe peace is inevitable. Thank you. <laughs>